What's up, Roto Grinders? Welcome back to Lucky Number 13, Week 13, NFL Pick 6 Show. It's myself, Dean, uh, on behalf of Roto Grinders, sponsored by Thrive. As usual, we got Rich Rebar, Sharp Football Analysis. We have John Daigle, 4 for 4, Bet Spurts. We're coming down the home stretch. We're not counting or anything here, Daigle, but Week Number 13. This is when this podcast, I think, officially hits its stride. I, I feel like that's when <laughs> we, finally, we finally hit the zone, right? Week 13 or so. We'll let we'll the, the viewers decide, but... That's sort of my uh, independent thoughts. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Rich has had some amazing takes, and he's been in winning lineups the past couple weeks. Uh, I had the Mac Jones put my boot to throat last week in the short slate. So I feel like we're hitting our stride quite well, like you said. So, yeah, it's an interesting slate as well. We have Patrick Mahomes back. We have Jalen Hurts back. We're going to talk about some cheapies that are in an amazing spot. So it's a fun week. Yeah, I wave my finger at you as far as Mac Jones, and you can wave it right back because you were right. I was wrong. Finally, you know, Martin Galing it. He finally had two touchdowns. It's been a while. As first time all season, I'm not sure if it was, but uh, he had himself a good yeah. game there on Turkey Night. Did you have anything interesting as far as lineups with uh, Mac Jones? Oh, yeah. Thanksgiving was amazing. I, I had Mac Jones doubles, and then just having Mac Jones doubles naturally allowed you to play Justin Jefferson because you obviously want the entire game stack. And uh, Josh Allen was a lot of – in a lot of winning lineups, at least on FanDuel, but for the rushing yards. But he only scored four more fantasy points than Mac Jones, who allowed you to spend up everywhere else. So I don't think anything too surprising on Thanksgiving. Rich Rich had an amazing call, citing the Patriots' defense and just noting to everyone that they actually haven't played anyone just yet. So uh, maybe we should be to on top of the Vikings' offense. So, yeah, we're coming off a good week with forward-thinking show. We'll try to be better, especially since I had the Ravens on Sunday. So uh, we'll try to get better. Anything of, uh, of note here, Rich, uh, as far as Thanksgiving, as far as any lineups, as far as Sunday main slate? Uh, anything that's uh, worth pointing out? Or like uh, John says, forward-looking show, you know, anything that's yeah, uh, worth yeah. acknowledging? No, no, it was another week where the 1 p.m. chalk didn't hit, and I was sitting on all this DK Metcalf and Devontae Adams ready to count uh, – my stacks of money that never came to fruition when those dudes got 26 targets and not one of them scored a touchdown. Uh, but Hey, we, we press on. I think this slate is awesome. I think from an NFL, like the NFL's had a lot of dog weeks this year and we mm. haven't had, a, you know, there are very few truly good teams. There's a lot of teams in the middle, uh, a lot of bad teams, but this slate of games, I think is by far, maybe it's just recency because it's this week and we've gone through a slog of weeks where they've been bad games. But this particular slate of games is one of the best that I maybe of the season so far. Yeah, I agree. Uh, by week, no Carolina, no Arizona. Of course, you know, we're talking the main slate. So we don't have Buffalo. They play on Thursday against the Pats. I mean, we don't have Dallas. They're a fun team as but well. But even that's a good Thursday night game. Yeah. yeah in yeah. context of Thursday night football. <laughs> yeah, Buffalo versus the Wing one should be. I, I might actually watch that one. There's only one NBA game on Thursday night, so I probably am going to watch that. Um, there's three teams, three games. We have a totals above 50, which I feel like we haven't had a 50 total mm -hmm. in a couple weeks at least, or maybe there's like one. Uh, it is wild, the games that we're going to be talking about, because as is per the show, the rules of the show, if people aren't aware, if this is your first time here, like where have you been? It's week 13. But we talk about three games, three main games. We break it down from all possible angles, and we kind of run it back to our fair place position by position. Uh, we are going to talk tight ends, despite the John not wanting to do so. <laughs> it's so, so gross, but you know, the, the DK and FanDuel, they require you to, to play a tight end, John. That's just how it goes. Um, sure. Fantasy football for some reason requires us to play a tight end when we should just cancel that position. Add another flex everyone next year. Add that flex. I would, I would like that actually, but uh, you know, we, we, uh, we, we petitioned the kickers off of FanDuel. I feel like that was the people speaking on that one. That many years ago, it finally went into effect. If you guys are, uh, it was a legit edge, though. I actually was upset by that one. <laughs> uh, I, I agree with that. And but also, he either like, just paid the punt or they played for Stephen Goskowski. It was like no in between. <laughs> it was like no in between. <laughs> I just went for the cheapest kicker in a dome, usually. <laughs> Honestly, if you like want the best like home league, you make your benches shorter and then add flexes because that forces cut decisions. Like some people in week six would have cut Rashad White because they couldn't afford to keep him. People would have cut Sky Moore. The list goes on and on. David Njoku even. Some teams in FFPC, like main event, that's a 2K league, had to cut David Njoku because we had decisions to make. So that's the way to do it. Shorter benches, more flexes. I'm in, uh, I'm in two season-long leagues, and it was the saddest thing cutting Cooper Cup, but I had 
Like there's no the, what was the quote? Like if the Rams back. make a run, like yeah, good luck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're making a run for sure. <laughs> making yeah. a run somewhere. The, 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 run the door is me. the door is nearby, to be fair. Yeah. <laughs> uh even uh with Donald, Aaron Donald's not playing this week as well, too. I don't know if you guys saw that earlier today. It's it's a mess uh as far as that Rams organization. Was it worth it? They got a title. No, no, yeah, absolutely. Is, I think yeah. so. Absolutely. I think it was worth it. You know, banners fly forever, is that what they say? And I know coaches like they're just mentally like not wired in the the way to just retire. But like I would like a dude for like McVay, like he's young enough and he's accomplished enough. He's got bags of cash. Like just go do something fun, man. Because like being an NFL head coach has to lightweight be like a miserable experience. And he said that two years ago, whenever he was married to a supermodel or Miss Universe, I should say, and then also had the bags of cash. He already mentioned that at 34, he can't sleep on a couch every single night until he's 40. He knows he's walking away. Yeah, it's just a matter so of cool. it's just a matter of whether those guys want to announce their retirement, Stafford, Donald, and McVeigh on the same day, or do they want to make it easier for everybody and like spread it out? But that's they're gone. They're done with this. Uh, didn't Sean Payton kind of sort of somewhat do that? Like he went into the booth and he also started starring in a, well, co-starring or making cameo appearances in Kevin James movies. But uh, like, isn't that kind of what, and then there's already rumors he's going to come back. But I'm talking about like guys just walking away. Like don't go to the booth. Just go, just go live. Just go live a life. Yeah. Just, I mean, what's there between $50 million and $150 million? I don't know, but in my brain, I feel like, like what, how many yachts do you need? <laughs> this is this is why it's still amazing that the Indianapolis tribalist booed Andrew Luck because he's the only one living right amongst us. He, he <laughs> literally jumped on a ship and just sailed out to the Amazon. You don't hear from him anymore unless he shows up in a high school locker room with his beard. He literally just disappeared off the face of the earth. That's the way you're supposed to live life. If you hear from him, though, you know you hear from him because he's had a very distinct voice. Yes. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if anybody can do it in the rep no. Andrew Luck. Cannot. Room. I can't either, but it's it's incredible. You know it. Like if you hear it 20 yards away, like wait a second, is Andrew Luck in the building? I feel I like you missed hear... the general Andrew Luck account though, the the Twitter account. <clears throat> oh yeah, that's right. Did the general convert to something else with all those followers or just it was retired and that's it? I don't know. Yeah, I, I totally it was, forgot a great, it was a good Twitter account. Damn though. shame. For one of the the the, the seven times Twitter has been used for the powers of good. <laughs> Dearest, what was the name? He would always, what's the, his wife's, what was the wife's name? Uh, I can't remember, but that was like, a, everything was like a letter, like written like a, like a letter, like writing home. Yeah, yeah. And Barry Sanders, <laughs> another one that did the same deal. He, well, he just couldn't take, I, I, well, Detroit, just so putrid, but, you know, and he got out, uh, I'm sure he's doing fine. I'm, I imagine he's not regretting his decision. It was a good run for him as well. Hey, uh, let's talk main slate. Let's talk the very first game on the sheet. It is the Jacksonville Jaguars. And the Detroit Lions, as always, the Detroit the Lions, six Lions are returning champions to the Detroit Lions. <laughs> <laughs> 51 and a half is the total. It's one of the big boy totals on this on this week. Uh, it's in December. It's in a dome. It's a weird one here, John, because I'm kind of like looking through it. Like It's a good environment. But trying to pick out individual plays, we don't know about Travis Etienne. Of course, we're recording on a Wednesday night. Yeah. We'll see if he's healthy and good to go. Uh, we saw a nice little breakout game out of Zay Jones. I don't know how consistent that's going to be going forward. Like, it's it's tricky because I, I I don't know if there's any like great individual plays outside, well outside of a couple obviously but you you, you tell me uh, you start with in Jacksonville Detroit wherever you want dealer's choice sell me on something it's so stupid too because they really do show up on this show every single week <laughs> and we did we did avoid them when they played the Patriots before their bye but also they had no one we were gonna play so we weren't we didn't care about that uh, but here we are yet again and the I'll start with the lines because. The boost of Trevor Lawrence, which Rich will tell everyone about, has suddenly now given this Lions offense a boost in this game naturally because we think we're going to get pushed back indoors. Logically, they're in the best spot. Like We got 10 days rest for the Lions offense at home. They stayed at home after taking the Bills down to a field goal. Not only that, this Jacksonville defense that continues getting overlooked because Trevor Lawrence has been so good the last three games, this Jaguars defense since week seven, Six yards per play, top nine in both rushing and passing yards allowed per game. And then even last week, I understand the Ravens didn't get there because fuck me, nothing gets there anymore. But the Ravens reached the red zone on six possessions. They ran nine goal-to-go plays. They just happened to kick more field goals than touchdowns scored. That's a whole other conversation for Baltimore's offense. But like genuinely, the Ravens didn't have issues at least getting in position to dominate. And so like, 
from what we've seen from this Lions offense, especially at home, we think they're going to be in position to dominate. And it kind of goes back to the same players because we talked about last week how you can't play Jamal Williams with Jared Goff. It's the same thing. Jamal Williams doesn't have a target in four consecutive games. Literally doesn't have one target in a month. So you're never playing him with Jared Goff. But you can stack the Jags offense with Jamal Williams or as a lot of people did on Thanksgiving, 33% in small field played a Monroe St. Brown with, with bill stacks. So at least we have a good direction of where to go here. Thinking this one goes over the total. Rich, what's your favorite place to attack here? You like the lions, you like the Jags. Uh, who are you looking at as far as this game? Yeah. I mean, I still like the Jaguars. I think with the lions, it's pretty clean. Like, you know, you're going to get to the sun God pretty naturally. I mean, he's just getting so many targets and so many catches that like, you know, just like on Thanksgiving, when you eventually get a touchdown, especially in a set like DraftKings, it's full point PPR. Like he can, he can get to 30, you know, he can get there. He's, he's floating around like 18 to 20 just every week anyways. So if you get into the box with him, I mean, you're all, you're just smashing. Uh, and he's got another just fantastic, you know, matchup again against the Jaguars. Uh, he, he actually plays like, you know, he is, he's not like a strict slot guy. He's like 50-50 inside and out. But the Jaguars are pretty uh, equally advantageous to kind of, you know, wherever receivers line up, uh, unless you're a Ravens wide receiver, uh, like John, John kind of alluded to. Uh, yeah. Don't get me started. Yeah. I, I mean, they're allowing a, a 5.9% touchdown rate to opposing slot receivers. They're also allowing a 7% touchdown rate to boundary receivers. That's 31st in the league. So it's kind of wherever you want to attack. Uh, it doesn't look like we're going to get Jamison Williams back on Thanksgiving. Josh Reynolds was active, but really didn't play. He has 10 days to kind of get back <clears> on the field. But these these ancillary kind of guys for the Lions just really haven't really done anything. You know, Khalif Raymond has been running a lot of exercise. Shark has a revenge game, and he scored a touchdown on Thanksgiving. Uh, but, you know, his, his like, production isn't really – you can't really lean on it. Like, he's a complete, you know, blind bag kind of play. Uh, so it really is just kind of the sun god and – if you want to play Jamal Williams, I'll just keep reluctantly not playing him and he'll keep scoring <laughs> touchdowns and twisting the knife into my heart because he's doing absolutely nothing else. 48% of his fantasy points have come just from touchdowns. It's absolutely insane. He just keeps getting away with it. Uh, it's He's not even having like the LeGarrette Blunt year from like 2018 because LeGarrette Blunt actually ran for like a ton of yards that year too. He just, he's just scoring touchdowns. He's not doing <laughs> anything else. It's like TG Duckett type stuff. Uh, absolutely just mind boggling. Um, but yeah, that's kind of where we are with the lions. Uh, Dale said like, we're not going to get to Jared Goff, especially on this slate, but man, this Jaguars defense is really bad. Uh, they have allowed top 10 fantasy scoring quarterback in five of their past six games are on 24 points per game over that stretch. And that's two guys. I think Matt Ryan had 28 fantasy points against them. Uh, Daniel Jones, uh, you know, Derek Carr at 19 feet, like these, like they're giving up just points to everybody. Uh, so the Lions are going to score points and they are one of the better offenses in the NFL anyways. So yeah, the Lions, I think are going to get there. Uh, so we can just move to the Jack side. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like, again, the Lions, I have a hard time getting excited about anybody except for Amon Ra. I probably am not playing golf yet. He's still way too cheap on DraftKings. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, on both sides, he's really, really productive. You know, I think he's still in the sevens on FanDuel as well. But on FanDuel, like in the sevens, like he could have eight for 90 and like not bear you. Yeah. But like at 7K, still eight for 90, or, you know, is, is flirting with like, you know, the get into the bonus and stuff. And if you get a touchdown, DraftKings, he can really get there. 8K on FanDuel, 7 1 on DK. So yeah, definitely a better play on DK when you consider, you know, salary and you consider just uh, how the scoring works. Uh, on Jacksonville, Rich, uh, I think you can't. I'm more likely if I'm going to play one of these points quarterbacks, this is going to be Lawrence. Uh, who am I oh. pairing him with? Is it going to be Christian Kirk or Zay Jones? About, I don't think I'm messing with Marvin Jones. Uh, tight ends, good lord. I'm not talking, you know, Evan Ingram's a guy who'll be playing tight end, I suppose, but no, probably not. You got a preference as far as how Detroit plays, Kirk or Zay? Yeah, definitely Kirk. I mean, he saw the nine targets last week, you know, just kind of ran cold the four for 46. It was a Zay day. Uh, you know, just Detroit, it's again, we saw it with Isaiah McKenzie on Thanksgiving. It's literally every week the opposing slot receiver is just jamming them up. Uh, they're 30th in points per game, a lot of opposing slot receivers in the slot. They're allowing a league high 11.3 yards per target. Uh, you'll get the past two weeks, Detroit against slot receivers, eight catches for 127 and a touchdown, 11 catches for 129 yards. Um, so yeah, I, I would just keep going right back to her. He has 20% of the team targets in every game but one this season. 
Uh, Zay Jones, I don't think is like a, necessarily a chasing the points play. I mean, listen, we used, we're joking. We used to call him optimal Zay Jones for weeks <laughs> on the show because he just kept popping up. Well, he wasn't the optimal last week. Uh, but he also, outside of the 14 targets last week, he also had 10 targets the week prior. So, like, the targets are, are there. He's he's getting, you know, kind of those. He lost one touchdown, though. That's kind of the, the only rub against him. But the price didn't really go up on him. And, you know, you look at uh, what Detroit does. We know they play a lot of man coverage, right? They play man coverage 38% of the time. That's the fifth highest rate in the league. And he has been targeted on a team high 28.9% of his routes against man coverage as opposed to 28% against zone coverage. So, I mean, I have no problem going back to him with it not being officially a point chasing type of element. John, you got anything to add there as far as Kirk versus Jones? Rich took all the slots uh, stats. <laughs> so no, uh, it's very clear, but also like, I know when you look at the, cause I've looked at the models around the industry between ETR for four roto grinders. Um, I know Christian Kirk is popping. So as much as I would like to him to be low rostered, people are definitely going to play him in this spot, especially because this slate practically revolves around. I'm not saying I'm going to do it, but we know people are trying to fit Chiefs Bengals pieces around this slate. So, you know, Christian Kirk still fits in as a player a little more expensive than Zay Jones. So, yeah, I still like Kirk better than Jones as well. We'll talk about the Chiefs soon enough. Well, I think they had 10 receivers on that, uh, catching at least one pass in that game. It's, man, playing the bingo game with Kansas City is so weird. And that's kind of an interesting thought. I'm curious to get your guys' opinion because – Kansas City can score 30 points, and theoretically, you can need nobody because they all can just sort of kind of do okay. Everybody just, like, even uh, even Kelsey had a mm-hmm. touchdown last week, and he was mm-hmm. kind of, I don't want say it was worthless, but it wasn't necessarily something he had to have. Uh, ATN 6 4 on DK, we'll see, but I mean, they, they have Henderson that may play at some point, right? Isn't Henderson on Jacksonville now? I think he didn't dress yeah, last week. They picked him up last week. Hastings and looked okay, the, right? The early reports are that Henderson, Peterson said, wouldn't play a lot. Like uh, they still want to get him warmed up to the playbook. So if he were active, it'd be one or two series. Like that's it. All right. Anything else here, John, as far as uh, – it's just a weird one because it feels like I just want to play Kirk versus Brown and that's that. Like, you know, and I guess I can play Lawrence, but it feels like it's a better game than I think it might actually be. And maybe yeah, I mean, that's wrong. I don't want to put my foot down and say, like, you can't play the cheapy quarterback on DraftKings like Lawrence because we were just in this situation a couple of weeks ago and Daniel Jones outscored the expensive quarterbacks at, you know, at under 6K. But at the same time, like, I do think Mahomes, Jalen Hurts, a couple others are in really good spots here, especially because Joe Burrow isn't that expensive as well. This quarterback slate is, is pretty bad. It's a good one. There's like eight quarterbacks I want to play, and I typically yeah. only play two to three, so we're going to need some whittling. That's the other part of it. It's like I don't know if I get like 20 points. Um, if, I get, if I get 20 points out of Lawrence, if that's good enough. Like, you know, if somebody else right. has it, uh, then yeah, I'm going to be chasing 17 points somewhere and hopefully I make up a difference in the salary I saved. All right, Chargers, Vegas. Uh, Chargers are one and a half point favorites uh, in Vegas. 50 and a half is the total. Uh, speaking of quarterbacks that are appealing – uh, you know, Justin Herbert uh, in the dome in December. Uh, he's And he's got ready-made pairings as far as receivers, Keenan Allen. You could pair him with Eckler. You're talking about the whole Jamal thing. You can't pair him with the quarterback. Eckler, what did he catch, like 11, 12, 13 passes? We thought that maybe he would lose a couple with Allen coming back. That didn't happen at least last week. Uh, Rich, start with the Chargers because uh, this Raiders defense also kind of horrendous. <laughs> you know, we went from uh, the the most advantageous home field for points scored to the second. And, you know, games in Vegas are averaging combined 53 points per game, which is second to only games in Detroit. So we were, we we're definitely honing around the proper totals this week. Eckler is having one of the weirder seasons I think I've ever <laughs> seen a player have. Like, it's absolutely insane. Like, the Chargers have basically, like, stopped trying to run the football at all. And – but then, like, you know, he's played the whole season basically with one of the main Chargers receivers hurt, sometimes both. Uh, he's He was already one of the best receiving backs in the league, but his, his like, per efficiency stuff receiving is by far career worse. Like, there's no reason for him to have this many targets. Like, he hasn't really been good with the targets, but, like, they just keep throwing all these dump-offs to him every week. I mean, he's he's basically, like, almost three full yards below his career average in yards per catch. Uh, and two full yards below his average in yards per target. But, like, he's just getting so many catches every week. Uh, and he, he has so much touchdown equity. Uh, it's so, so wild, though. And you look at, like, his rushing box scores, and they're, like, 
he's got like single digit touches like in the running game, like in, in so many games. And last week he had 20 rushing yards. He had five carries. There's like, screw this. We're out of here. Um, just bonkers. So he's essentially just getting handoffs through the air, right? Like that's yeah. what, that's what's happening in this offense. And that's a product of the receivers, Joe Lombardi, the, uh, all the above, whatever you want to do it. Cause Herbert's dropping back 46 times per game. It's the most in the NFL. Uh, he's getting this Raiders team. We've, we've picked on them the entire year, right? Like, you know, we've, we've talked about whoever they're playing. Uh, they're allowing 17 passing points per game. That's 29th in the NFL. They've allowed nine QB1 scoring weeks in the season. That's the most in the NFL. His past three games against the Raiders, he scored over 20 fantasy points. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, Herbert looks particularly appealing. And you like you said, you can play him with Eckler. And now that Keenan Allen is back and we saw him run a route on 93% of the dropbacks last week, against another team that's bad against slot receivers uh you've got your inherent stacking partners already built in i, I saw somebody on twitter ask a ridiculous question like if J- is jalen hurts a quarterback like which is an absurd i'm not sure if you guys saw that tweet don't get me started it's like yeah. I, if he's, but like if you're gonna ask that question at least ask like is austin eckler a running back like he is but at least that's a better question to ask right I, I have a I have a better question. If your quarterback can run for a hundred yards in the first quarter every week, <clears throat> you care if he's a quarterback. Like, who, <laughs> why are you even asking this question? Also, the I... the premise of that is pretty misguided because we already know through a bunch of data points that guys don't really get hurt scrambling. Right. All right. So uh, Austin Eckler, uh, you know, he, he had sixteen targets last week. Just pure <laughs> insanity. Uh, and their their targets were like he's going to catch them like what 70 80 percent of the time I think because it's just like you and said 60 yards time. 60 yeah. yards like it's hilarious man it's just it's, it's crazy man and and, and, all the the, and and the Raiders are the worst team in receiving points allowed to running backs yeah uh, so I think we like that like some Eckler how was Allen in his return John did he get enough reps I guess it wasn't his official return he turned the week before yeah. but last week he ramped it up a little bit more he did get in the box to kind of salvage I don't think it was spectacular otherwise. Uh, and the rest of the receiving core as far as the Chargers. And, you know, amongst all the quarterbacks on the slate, John, where do you have Justin Herbert? And he was – Allen was under a 20% target share because DeAndre Carter played more on the outside. But Allen was still on the field for over 90% of routes run. Like, he returned to being a full-time player. And this offense, although it may not be explosive, like Ritz mentioned, like to Herbert, again, averaged under five yard – a five A dot. And thus, like, a lot of people rostered him against the Cardinals, but he still didn't get there. Uh, the issue is that, yes, like Allen still is on this field and he makes the team better. So I, don't, I still don't mind Allen in this spot at all. But for the Raiders, the thing is, like, we know, especially in this quarterback heavy slate, we also can't play Derek Carr. Like, we we know the natural options in either Devontae Adams, maybe you sprinkle in Matt Collins and Foster Moreau if you want to play pay down at tight end. But Derek Carr, six games since their bye, has not finished inside the top 10 quarterbacks. He doesn't have a single top five finish at all on the year. So he just doesn't have the ceiling in a, in a slate with Patrick Mahomes and everyone else to even warrant our attention. So, no, I think it's pretty straightforward that Herbert's a sexy option. And then, like, we will stick to either Adams, Moreau, or in large field, Hollins. Rich? Yeah, I mean, we're waiting to see what's going to happen with Josh Jacobs. Obviously, everyone would want to, to play him here. I mean, 39 touches last week. Like, the, the stuff of DFS. After war. getting injured, too. Like, what a what a beast, man. What a I was told there was a real chance he couldn't play, even start the game. Uh, he got injured in practice on Friday, and then mm-hmm. in the middle of the game, he hurt himself, too. He, like, yes, he, yeah, he, he looked like he was going to come out of the game for a little bit, and then, you know, came back. and 39 touches, 300 yards. The first running back to have over 300 yards in a game since Adrian Peterson in 2007. Obviously, you get the 86 yard house call, house call to end it. But I mean, this is a, a year, the whole year thing. It's like Jason Jacobs has come out of nowhere. Like he's just been getting this enormous workload the entire season. That was his fourth game with over 30 PPR points. Like he's been, he's had a massive ceiling. And obviously, if he was healthy, we'd want to play him against this Chargers defense who we target every week. And if he doesn't play by the time we get to, you know, Saturday, Sunday, and you, you get that 3 a.m. Schefter tweet that like, so the Raiders are going to hold out Josh Jacobs. And then <laughs> everyone's just going to jam Zamir White. In. Not Amir, Amir Abdullah and his uh, Boogie Nights-esque karate kicks. 
Yeah, I mean, he, he'll get a, he'll probably get a little bit uh, of a tickle, but like we know what his role is, right? Like he's yeah. gonna be the passing down back. It's yeah, it, it, it's ambiguous play. enough to maybe it screws it up, but yeah, like Amir Dula and Brandon Bolden have been active for more games than Zamir White this year, but they don't have more than three carries in any game. Like they don't profile as guys who would be on early downs or the goal line. That's that's all Zamir White, which is the same thing he did at George as well. So yeah, we we know who the fallback is here and i agree with the assessment like again i historic, i just can't play these quarterbacks that can't move mm-hmm. their only out is throwing for like 350 and three or 304 uh i guess i guess 303 is acceptable for Derek carr but that's like the only way he gets there you know he, he can't run he can't move unless he gets a quarterback sneak from the one or something like that i just can't see myself basically ever rostering i mean if i like you know Devontae adams i'll just buy him on a car i don't need to pair him with, the, with Derek carr uh, are we talking about Foster Morogan this week? Can we please stop talking about him. For some reason, uh, everyone wants to keep going to the, the <laughs> island, the island of Foster Moreau. Um, I mean, do you, just, you just you just you jam Devonte Adams in. It's all you do. I mean, also you have to be encouraged. Like the Raiders are cognizant, right? That like he's their only like really good passing game asset right now that they can play. And we're still a week away before maybe Darren Waller or Hunter Renfro play, which we'll see even if they do when they can. But you you, you look at what they did last week. They moved him around away from three goal in the entire game. He basically played right wide receiver the whole game uh, to get him away. He didn't have the huge problem. He still had 11 targets and he still had 30% of the team targets. He had over 30% of the Raiders targets in four straight games. He has double digit targets in four straight games. Um, 38% of the team targets over the last four weeks. I mean, just the dude is just getting so much volume. And the, when these teams played earlier this season, he had a 53% target share. So, man, just jam him. The, that was the first game of the year, right? I think that was the yeah, first big yeah. one. The, the only thing you can say about Foster Moreau is that he did score more fantasy points and was cheaper <laughs> on both sites than the winning tight end last week in Hayden Hurst, <laughs> who made his way into cash games. But at the same time, that's only because of lineup construction. Like no one, even the great Blender, who I appreciate, I've had <laughs> drinks with, but no one, even Blender, can galaxy brain enough to get onto Foster Moreau and Josh Jacobs along with Geno Doublestack. So you were never going to get there. So that's why Josh Jacobs just ended up being in winning lineups as well as cash game Hayden Hurst. Where do you have drinks with, uh, with Blender? Uh, Nashville, whenever – this company that we are under used to run Super Bowl parties. Dan Bach, please start it again. <laughs> bring back Super Bowl parties. Bring it back. Hashtag bring it back. I uh, I spend my Sundays with Blender uh, six fifteen all the way up to the end of a uh, you know the, the, the four o'clock window. Yeah. We're on Twitter Spaces just ranting about well just but well, we go we go off on some rants and some nonsense and all that. We're just watching the games like two guys on the couch and uh, so yeah my, myself and Blender we've had a lot of conversations every single week. We we talk. Uh, the slate, and it's a he's a good yeah, a good brain to pick for sure. As far and, as, and then y'all watch red zone for sacks and interceptions every week. Yeah, it's the worst because he's like ahead of me by twenty seconds. He's in Louisville. Uh, oh, and he he just spoils everything away. And he, we live in a society, but he doesn't care. He just he wants to spoil everything. Yeah. And like I want to watch it organically. It ruins it. Uh, all right. I, I'll, I'll well, you it. clearly don't want to watch it organically. <laughs> What do you mean? Why not? I don't want to know the spoils. <laughs> or am I using organic wrong? I think I'm using organic wrong. Is that what's going on? Never mind. Uh, are we done with this game, Rich? Anything else that's up notes as far as Raiders and Chargers? We know who to play here, right? Uh, no, I will say that if it, if you end up getting to where Mike Williams is out again, that I think it, it does. There is more of a signal that it's another DeAndre Carter game over Josh Palmer game. If you need the Galaxy brain into another Charger. It seems likely Williams doesn't play, right? Is that the more likely case? Yeah, I mean, he didn't go on IR, so it's like any of the times like, these guys didn't officially go on IR, you just take that on a week-to-week basis. And honestly, like, again, I, not that I'm doing it, but I understand that everyone else is trying to do it. Like, DeAndre Carter is probably a, a good fit in this slate. People will probably get to him trying to fit the Chiefs and Bengals. Is that one of those, like, placeholders and maybe something pops up better on Sunday morning, or you think it's actually a good play, Carter, John? Uh, like Rich said, it's not a bad play given that Justin Herbert in itself is probably one of four quarterbacks I'll be overweight on this week. Uh, but at the same time, yeah, we, we might get some cheap running back value. We're kind of waiting on a lot of things. This week is a disaster. 
<laughs> Rich said he loves this slate, and you said it's a disaster. Well, I well, think no, it, no, I, no. I think what he means he's pretending just like there's a lot of uh, running if, back if situations then. yet to be yes. decided yeah, on if Wednesday. Then. Yeah, you know we have Jacobs, we have Etn, who we just kind of you know glossed over in the last game. Uh, we don't really know what's going to happen to Christian McCaffrey quite yet. We did get some a little bit of clarity for the Steelers situation, but like. There are some of these like cheapy guys, and if Michael Carter's out, maybe you know people chase the Zonovan Knight stuff. So like, there is still kind of like some ambiguity, like those uh, that that sub stack are running backs. And Joe Burrow is cheap, so it, it opens up a little bit. But we also like are questioning how many snaps Joe Burrow or uh, Jamar Chase will play. Like, yeah, there's just there's and like the Chiefs receivers, dude. I mean, you want to talk about a situation that may not yeah. even matter if we get it right. Like, it's just it's it's wild out there. Yeah, that feels like it could be, be a lot of fun for the guys at MME, like showdown slates. That'd be a great show. Yeah. Kansas City against showdown is a great time to just sort of differentiate because we'll talk about that game in a second. But what I'm hearing you guys say is basically don't listen to this uh, podcast on Sunday morning. It's a, it's a much more of a, a place setter, an appetizer as far as week 13. Well, the Things rumor are- has it you sit down with Blender on Sunday mornings from 6.15 on, so maybe listen to that instead. Yeah. No, no, it's 6. Well, how about waking up 6 o'clock in the morning and talk to Blender? <laughs> No, no, it's, we're watching the game. They're watching the main slate in the afternoon. We're talking oh, about, I thought you meant 6.15 A until no, kickoff, y'all. Are you serious? Oh, God, no, dude. Listen, I don't want to wake up and talk they, to anybody. They cut our Super Bowl party, Blender. Dean. I don't know where that money goes to, so I don't know. <laughs> I am Actually, I do kind of get up early Sunday mornings. You know, yeah, I get up Sunday time, mornings. Usually I'm up by uh, 7 o'clock. Who knows? We'll see. All right. Uh, we've teased Kansas City and Cincinnati a couple times. 52 and a half is the total. That is a big boy number. Kansas City's a two and a half point favorite. You mentioned the John Chase. Like last week, Burrow, like, unless I heard him correct, I thought he said that Chase was coming back. He's either a liar or was misinformed or things changed. Turns out I, he's not a doctor. Yeah. <laughs> I assume Chase is coming back this week. We'll see. Stay tuned on that, uh, which kind of just muddies stuff up again because Kansas City, again, they have all these pass catchers in the world. Uh, and then Cincinnati, now you add Chase and Higgins and Boyd, and Boyd's fallen back the last several games as well, too. We don't know about Mixon. I assume it's just a one-week deal as far as a concussion, but as of Wednesday night, he's not officially past it, but he seems to be on the right path. Uh, John, uh, feel free to attack this game whatever angle you want to take. Uh, I'm hoping Reeves has a, because I've deep dove into it throughout the week, and I can't explain why Tyler Boyd has just disappeared off the face of our earth. So maybe Reeves has has something for me. But honestly, it's hard for me to, as much as I want to, hate this spot for Joe Burrow. Chiefs allowing the third highest passing touchdown percentage in the entire league and remain the only defense permitting a 70% touchdown rate inside the red zone. Whereas the Bengals, like that's already their strength. They don't even need the weakness of the Chiefs defense. And yet they're going to get it because the Bengals are one of only three offenses scoring a touchdown on at least 71% of their red zone possessions. So uh, like with Burrow being so cheap on DraftKings in particular, I think it's a conversation on FanDuel, but on DraftKings where he's 6,900, like, I, I don't know. Like it's an amazing spot. Of course it is, even though I want to pay up for other quarterbacks. So yeah, that's where I kind of start this conversation at. And I would tend, he's definitely going to get steamed. I think people are absolutely going to play Burrow. So I may need your help here, Dean, for both the early Wednesday projections for Bengals and Chiefs wide receivers ownership whenever we talk about them. Because like naturally, Chase being an over-the-top player, people are going to play him. But I would actually prefer to lean towards him being limited. The, the quote he had earlier about trying, at least thinking he can get reps in by Friday – makes me want to back off him a little bit and thus lean on T Higgins target share these past three games heavily. And instead of chase, that's kind of where I'm at right now with this offense. So I have a, I ran some optimals on both FanDuel and DraftKings. And again, the qualifier is really, really important. This is Wednesday night. This is not gospel, but it is interesting on DraftKings because a quarterback wise, nobody gets more than 17%, 17% Geno Smith, 16% Burrow, and again, we also have these great salary savers too. So we're kind of saving salary at quarterback. Lawrence at 15% and Watson at 14%. Carr at 13. Uh, on Fandle, Lamar is cheaper. Uh, he's 8 2 over there. He's 30%. And Hertz, you know, the cap a little bit looser. You're getting Hertz at 17%. Then Mahomes, 15%. So traditionally, it's kind of how it works, right? You tend to be more able to uh, spend up a quarterback on Fandle as opposed to DK. Uh, give me a second and I'll see what I have as far as receivers, but I'll throw it to. Uh, so, Rich, what do you have as far as this take? Feel free to 
attack it however way you wish uh, you, you prefer. Yeah, I mean, listen, I brought up the stat a few times because it keeps holding true and it doesn't move. But the Chiefs are 31st in the league in passing points allowed per attempt. They also face the third most pass attempts in the NFL. When you put those two things together, they've allowed the most passing points per game in the NFL. And it just keeps getting there. If you look at over the past eight weeks, every single quarterback has gotten there to have a top 10 week except for Malik Willis and Bryce Perkins. That's it. Those are the only two guys that haven't gotten there. <laughs> and basically those teams were not allowed, they weren't allowed to throw those games or just, you know, the Rams, I don't know what they put on the field last week. But yeah, I mean, this is a spot where Burrow should absolutely stack volume through w- w- one way or another, right? Chasing points or just through matchup naturally being aggressive. And they have been aggressive. Uh, you know, when you look at over the past five weeks, the Bengals are first in the NFL in early down passing rate and the Chiefs are second. Uh, this is how you get there. And you look at both quarterbacks. I mean, uh, Josh Allen is first in percentage of touchdowns he's accounted for for his team touchdowns, passing and rushing. Joe Burrow is second. Patrick Mahomes is third. So, like, yeah, it's it's hard to not get away from these quarterbacks in this game. It's it just like being like kind of the head pins that you kind of want to get on to and then trying to figure out who you want to stack them with afterwards. I mean, Mahomes has thrown for seven, or, uh, seven straight 300-yard games. Like, the dude is – is just putting – it doesn't matter who's on the field, right, to give me any wide receivers, and I'm going to get there. Um, and, man, he would have went nuts last week if they were – they scored one touchdown on six red zone possessions. They're dicking around running these dumbass plays again in the red zone. <laughs> I know they gave Pacheco uh, a couple inside the five carries last week and everyone was happy, but they ran literally the worst trick play I've ever seen a team run on the five-yard line. It was so Kansas City Chiefs. Um, Kelsey was talking about it in his podcast, and he was just like, "Yeah, we didn't get the kind of the look we wanted." I, uh, it's like, dude, this is the most ludicrous play I've ever seen. It was, run. <laughs> it was, it was the most play down to your competition game the Chiefs ever faced. Like a professional <laughs> quarterback throwed for a hundred yards and two picks against them, and they didn't even care. They were just trying shit out the whole time. Yeah, uh, but this Bengals defense like has picked up a bunch of injuries like kind of along the way to this point in the season. I mean, you look at. Uh, the past four weeks, I mean, Jacoby Percet had 20 fantasy points against them. Baker Mayfield comes in at a half and almost put up a QB one week. Uh, Kenny Pickett had 16 fantasy points against them. Ryan Tannehill had nine yards for pass attempt and 291 passing yards last week, just didn't throw a touchdown. So, I mean, Mahomes is probably going to get there, right? Uh, we'll see what, you know, the Bengals do as far as rolling over what they did last year in the playoff game where, you know, they, they went with like a three-man pass rush. Obviously, there's no Tyreek Hill here. Uh, so we'll see what kind of goes down with that. But uh, right now, the, the, the Chiefs, I almost call them Patriots, uh, they, they, they face man coverage at one of the highest rates in the NFL. And bang, the Bengals play man coverage at the 10th highest rate in the league. So, like, we'll see if they really change it up and go to kind of adjustments they made during the playoff game last year versus a totally different kind of Chiefs personnel. Setting aside Kelsey, uh, Rich, like the tricky part is Mahomes. Yeah, money in the bank, but his receivers – who knows? We don't know if we'll have Tony this week. Uh, Juju came back from the concussion last week. I think they brought him along pretty slowly as far as his snaps, as far as his targets. And that's the worry with Mixon in this game. Yeah. Um, just does he? The, the worry is you. We would rather just for the sake of DFS argument, just have Mixon be out. Mm-hmm. And just then play we can. P-Rine? Then we just know we can play P Ryan instead of saying, "Well, Mixon's active, grid spot." But does he play the full lot of the snaps now? Why wouldn't he though? Like it's either either you're concussed or you're not. It's not like an injury. Well, like you you say that, but then look at Juju last week when he was the third most routes mm-hmm. on the team. And um, yes, he did not play a full practice before the week. He got cleared for concussion protocol on Saturday. But at the same time, yeah, like maybe it is limited coming back. And I just think in the context of this NFL season, after what happened at Tua, yeah. it's people have handled like it top down. Concussions have been handled differently, a uh, little more kids glove, which they should be, I, I would assume, you know, I'm not educated enough to know, but like, yeah, we're talking about a brain injury and it's a running back. Like, yeah, you know, so it also is Zach Taylor. So who the hell knows? Right. Like it's a team by team thing. I think it's yeah. how, how, how risk averse they may And be. also Samaj Adrian played really well the last two weeks. So maybe they want, and they obviously have this affinity for him, right? Like they went out and signed him. Uh, they gave him a contract extension. They obviously ran a fourth down and one play in the Super Bowl with the game on the line to him. 
uh, they're they actually like this guy, and he's played well the last two weeks, so maybe they still incorporate him. Um, I mean, that was a tough, gritted out Mike Vrabel win, honestly, for the Bengals last week. But like P. Ryan, seventy five percent of his yards came after contact. He handled eighty seven percent of backfield touches. Like, yeah, I think they like P. Ryan as well. I think they just respect their offense the same amount, whether it's Mixon or P. Ryan. Oh, you asked, John, and I'm looking. Uh, I ran 150 optimals on DK. We did. We did give a projection to Chase, so we're projecting Jamar Chase in. Yep. Uh, Higgins hit on 13. percent uh, Juju Smith hit on three percent, and that's it on DK. Uh, so, like these receivers are not. You know, this is optimal. There's no. I'm not putting any rules like you know runbacks and things like that. Uh, on Fanduel, did the same thing here, and T Higgins at three percent. I don't think I see a Chiefs receiver just unless I missed one. It's Wednesday. Yeah, uh, I, th- yeah. I think the ancillary pieces, though, given that we aren't scared of any defense for the Bengals, even if they were healthy, uh, I-, I think maybe for smaller field and onslaught Chiefs is probably the way to go here. But either way, yeah, this game is this game's enticing. Just, I mean, the issue is that Justin Watson has led this team in routes run the last three games. Well, let's just cut it down. Let's say the last two weeks he's run more routes than Marcus Valdez scaling led the wide receivers in routes run the last two weeks as well, but he's only earned six targets. Whereas Sky Moore has run a 46% route rate in week 11 without Juju, but Juju returns and the Sky Moore dips in route participation, but is still like earning a target on 32% of his routes. So like no matter what Sky Moore does in the passing game, and they've shown this all year long, it's week 13. They're not surprising us with like Sky Moore running the most routes on the team. Uh, they will continue to just like look over Sky Moore no matter what opportunity he has. So that's the thing. Like you could play Justin Watson, you absolutely can, and people will. But also, is he going to earn more targets, or like are we banking on two touchdowns? Because I think it's the latter. Yeah, I like. I think Sky Moore is the is the the move if you're playing like stacks in this game is cheap. I mean, he's basically essentially playing the role McCall Hardman had yeah. and that Kadarius Tony had, and immediately. Kadarius Tony did Kadarius Tony thing. His hamstring just like you know, but Pazuda always talks. Pazuda always talks on our show that like just humans aren't supposed to move like him. So like <laughs> you know, unfortunately, he still has a human hamstring. So <laughs> it, it just it just can't. He's really he's Yao Ming of football. Yeah, you're not <laughs> supposed to look like that or play like that. So sure, yeah. But he's essentially in that McCall Hartman role. Sky Moore is that that like that's, that guy's not running like uh, a bunch of those like hollow routes that like Marcus Vallis Scantley is running and Justin Watson's running. But the the plays that he is involved in in the game are plays he's are involved in in the game. Uh, he just needs to get some of that that goal line usage that McCall Hardman had, right? That's what that's what you need. But he's really cheap on both sides. I think he's three one on DraftKings. Uh, gives you a big window if you get a touchdown and just a sprinkling of receptions. He does play in the slot a little bit too. We do want to chart the Bengals are another team. It's been like a theme of the show. I feel like uh, they're another team like you want to target with like interior players. Uh, Ten yards per target to opposing slot receivers. That's twenty eighth. 45 of all wide receiver receptions, uh, 45% of all wide receiver receptions against the Bengals have come from the slot. That's the sixth highest rate in the league. So, yeah, you would want to get to, like, those interior guys, like Juju, if you believe he gets ramped up uh, his second week back, and then Sky Moore getting some of those interior routes, too, if you're just not including Kelsey as a slot receiver. We should also mention Pacheco, what, 23 opportunities last week, 22 carries. He actually is he's capable of catching a football, which I told you I was told he wasn't. Uh, the football was thrown in his direction, and he caught it. Uh, it's good for him. He's still pretty cheap. Um, you know, on, on DK, PPR site, yeah, you might catch one or two if you're lucky, but you kind of got to get that 100 and a touchdown to get there. Mm-hmm. Um, official Pacheco take, John. Oh, well, it's as Rich said, they, they literally were just dicking around. They didn't care. <laughs> they were just trying stuff out inside the five yard. That's why we saw Pacheco pop for a season high five carries inside the five yard line. So, yeah, I'm just not, I'm not too worried You're about it. No, I, I, not in this game. And the Rams had made sense because that's a team that we already talked about, you know, everything they threw out on the field. That That's a team that we knew weren't going to compete. The, the Chiefs covered their 14 and a half spread. There was literally nothing to worry about in the game whatsoever. Uh, this game, they will lean on their best players, and that's Patrick Mahomes. We didn't talk about Kelsey. Like, what do we got to say here, John? Like, if you have the money for Kelsey, by I all know. means, play Kelsey. Yeah, it just, yeah it's, it's, a, it's a competitive game. Like, the last week, it, last week, it wasn't really about, and I'm frustrated about it because 
Mark Andrews ended up being 15 to 20 percent roster, depending what field you played uh, as chalk. And again, even if it's Mark Andrews, you never played chalk tight end. But we also knew the Rams were never going to hang around. So Kelsey got that long touchdown. But again, it didn't matter because they were never going back to him. Now we have a competitive Travis Kelsey game. So like this is the game where he ends your soul. This is the game where like paying down for Foster Moreau seems like you're an idiot. Rich, you can't say Kelsey. Give me your favorite uh, receiving person <laughs> on each side of this game. Assume Chase is in. Uh, T. Higgins. I'm just hoping he gets lost in the sauce because he's priced up high, but not. He's the you know if you're gonna pay up, most people are just like, well, shit, I'm just gonna play Devontae Adams. So I'm gonna pay this much for a receiver. Play Tyree Kill. Um, so hopefully he just gets kind of lost under that kind of you know crest because I mean you can attack the uh, the, the Chiefs DBs with a good wide receiver. Uh, we've seen it w- weekly. Right. Like, you know, so I, I would still want to play T Higgins a lot uh, if I can. Kansas city. Uh, I like, I like the sky more kind of punt man on both sites. Like only in stacks of this game though. Like I don't really care for much as like a one-off if you're just looking for a cheap guy, but. I Rich, do did like you agree him. with that Pacheco take? I just, I heard John was going to not wave him. Um, yeah, I'm more or less there too. I think too. Also, you know, you look at this bang, this Bengals matchup. Uh, you know, since you know, with DJ Reader on the field, they they have a 77 percent success rate against running back carries with DJ Reader on the field. That's number one in the NFL. They're allowing just 3.2 yards per carry uh, to running back carries with Reader on the field. Uh, he went up. He he returned last week, two weeks ago, I should say, in week 11, and then went up to 74 percent of snaps last week. And you see the run defense kind of look a lot better against Derrick Henry. Um, who might be playing hurt to himself. Uh, so I do think it might be more of just a pass heavy game where we see a lot more McKinnon. Cause you just don't know if Pacheco, right? Like he's so contingent on one getting a touchdown and yeah, then, yeah. you know, getting catches. And I never like to play running backs like that. Like, especially when we talk about what could open up near Pacheco's price point, like guys like Jalen Warren, right? Like who could be involved in the past game. Uh, we don't know about, like I said, like Jamichael hasty, like a guy, there could just be like too many guys that, I, I feel better from like a floor stance, uh, but I can see like Pacheco, if you want to chase just like, Hey, this game's going to have, could be in the mid fifties. I'm just trying to luck box and some tuds. He's, he's averaged 18 carries per game. The last three games. Uh, I played him last week or I late swapped onto him last week, knowing he'd be 5%. Yeah. It's just, you know, it's, it is like Rich said, it's touchdown or bust. And you might not even get there with a touchdown. That's the problem. Yeah. Like he could actually have a touchdown and maybe not get there still. He he didn't matter last week at all. Yeah. No, running back was so strong. And that's yeah. that even if, J- if Jacobs was like healthy and there was no like issue, he still wouldn't have been known just the way the slate set up. That's that's why like I can be frustrated that Jacobs was a late swap option with a top five ceiling. And so he got there. Um Osimo took down the spy, or I should say Stocktastic took down the spy. <laughs> Uh, but also like he didn't lace off onto him. He kind of had a naturally built into it. Um, but yeah, also like that was the build. That's why I was so happy because the GPP bros won last week. They double stacked Gino rather than playing Ken Walker. And then they played high ceiling expensive running backs rather than playing the chalk. So it just made so much sense in the build. Yeah. It was the first week kind of like the, the, the chalk running backs Hell yeah. all, all failed. I, I mean, love it. <laughs> You knew right away Jeff Wilson wasn't getting there. Like it was like twenty nothing off rip. You're like, oh, Jeff Wilson's not. He's not he going to get there. He had, he had ten carries for seven yards for twenty minutes, <laughs> and then Michael Carter got hurt. Like yep. you know, uh, yeah, he, Wilson Rashad, got hurt too. Man. He he was he was out for yeah. a bit at least. And Rashad, then Rashad yeah. White running behind the Bucks O line like never even mattered in the first place. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right. Uh, hey, we're going to give our favorite plays position by position in a second. We're going to give our uh, – we've been starting this week, this week uh, our movie bets. We're going to have that paid off. We all watch the interview. We'll talk about that soon enough as well. I'm going to pay off or give you guys a movie to watch because I took down the four man last week you did. with a lineup that smashed, by the way. I don't know what our uh, – I ended up somewhere – You played the, the chalk. No, no. There was a – no, no. My tight end – You played – he played a, he played a Cardinals-Charger stack. Okay, yeah, yeah. Played- he, was he like, played the chalk. No, Murray was like eight percent or something like that in the the single entry. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah, he played yeah, the yeah. quintuple up pivot. Is what he played. Yeah, I might have right. I might have done that. But uh, another good week for the quintuple ups, by the way. Another yeah. good week. The uh, the Roto Grinders sponsored a single entry series. I, I was making a run. I was in the top ten, and then after Jacobs and <laughs> I fell back to like fifteen or twenty. It was still a nice little payoff. But uh, you guys ran into a buzzsaw this last week. It's all yeah. I'm saying. It was. Uh, I'm just gonna keep finishing second every week. It's the goal. <laughs> Always a bride. You'll today. never watch a movie that I, I want you to watch. 
I want to pick a good one. You know, uh, producer Steve was kind, so I'll be kind to you guys. We'll talk about that soon enough. Do want to mention our sponsor, our sponsor Thrive. Join in on the fantasy prop action this NFL season with Thrive Fantasy. Easy to play, no salary cap style contest revolves around over under style player props. How does that work? Each prop has a fantasy score associated with the prop. The riskier the prop happens to be, the higher the fantasy score. You rack up the most points for your share of the prize pool. And we're going to give you a sweet deposit bonus as well. That is Grinders, G R I N D E R S. When you sign up uh, for a deposit bonus up to $250, you also get additional tickets. Uh, if you deposit between $100 and $499, you get two free $20 contest tickets. Deposit an extra buck, $500 or more, you get six free $20 contest tickets. Again, use the promo code GRINDERS on Thrive. Uh, taking a peek at their main contest going down this week, you got to pick 10. 10 of these 20 props. We're going to give you guys a couple. Producer Steve's going to put them up on the screen. Hopefully, John, you've had enough time to gaze over and uh, – what pops out for you? If uh, I think it's 100K as far as the prize pool. If you finish first, you get 20,000 smackers. John, some of your favorite props on Thrive are what? And again, ambition. We like ambition. Be as ambitious as possible. Don't take the layups. Uh, it's not necessarily a layup, but Thrive is giving us even money, 100 points on A.J. Brown, whether we go over or under. And why will we not go over in this spot? And we'll talk about that more when we get to positional plays. But just the last two weeks alone, A.J. Brown has accounted for 30% of the team's targets without Dallas Goddard. Uh, I And also remember, he was limited last week. So, yeah, I want to go back to A.J. Brown in this spot for sure. Uh, go scroll down a little bit. And I would like to also take Trevor Lawrence over 21 and a half completions. For everything we talked about, a uh, 30 point difference. Do you think that's worth it, Dean? That's the question here. Yeah. I mean, you know, you could have a couple of those, sure. You got to hit it, obviously. But do, yeah. Do you know? <laughs> so I haven't reviewed this. Like, has, has someone typically won this contest, the bit large field contest on Thrive, with like a 30 point margin going under? Uh, I'm sure it's happened. I can't say with the uh, conference actually physically going through it, but I presume yeah. so. I think you got to go 10 and 0. You know, and then uh, I think you can take a couple of those. And All right. Well, you hit like a, one of the more ambitious numbers. You're getting like, you know, 115, 125 points. I'll mark. live to I'll live to reach for a home run. I'll just take the layup for everything we talked about already with Trevor Lawrence and take the more than 21 and a half. Reeves? Uh, let's see. Looking up, I think you could start. I mean, t- you're getting uh, a little bit of juice on Tyler Lockett under 60 and a half receiving yards. He's basically the last six weeks been like, his high is 68, and I'm assuming the Seattle's just not going to throw a pass in the second half of that game. <laughs> uh, they might not have to. Uh, so I think you're getting a pretty good squeeze on that because he really hasn't put up a lot of yards. Where Lockett's getting there is he, he, he scores a touchdown every game. Like, that's that's where he kind of is getting there. Um, I, I kind of like that. I got a uh, layup. I don't want to steal anybody's Yeah, what, well, the Najee but... Harris one? Yeah, that's a Well, no, one. no. Like, uh, we talked about this. <laughs> How many yard, How many games in a row has Pat Mahomes thrown over 300 plus yards? Six. Okay, so the number is 285 and a half. Oh, we're getting, we're he, getting 100 points on this. He's he's, lit, he's literally averaged 362 yards his last six games. Uh, Derek Hardy, the blitz, has him projected currently for 319 passing yards. Like that seems as a projection. Yeah, yeah, that's even that's a money. Projection. Yeah. That's a medium projection. That's I also really like the uh, the Derrick Henry under 115 total yards. I yep. think is pretty interesting. Something's going on with Derrick Henry. Who they I, don't I don't uh, know. You know, like three weeks ago, he was a DNP with a foot injury, and like ever since then, he's he's only run for 2.8 yards per carry since then, and they're. They're, the Tennessee's getting to be more aggressive passing. Like you look at their pass rate over rotation the past three weeks, like they're throwing more on early downs. He still has a lot of touches. So I don't really know how hurt he is, but there's something going on there. It's uh, Denver though. You want to bet against Henry? And ooh, yeah, good call. But like, you know. <laughs> also, also remember this is the same coach and organization that brought him back off foot surgery and gave him 21 touches in the playoffs in a must win game. And he averaged two yards per carry then as well. Plus their road, their their road, their road dogs uh, by five and a half points. Like they could be forced to throw. Like I don't know, man. I like the gamble on that one. I mean, I wouldn't like bench Derek Henry any season long leagues or anything, but like I kind of like the under on that one. And if you think Mixon comes back, but like he's half staff, uh, sixty nine and a half is his number. You can bet under that. You know, as far as rushing yards, like you know, there's some ifs there, but 
if he comes back and you think that P. Ryan's earned himself a few extra carries, I don't know, kind of sort of somewhat interesting. It's a, good, they, the weird, a lot of weird quarterback uh, props on this one. Like you got Jared Goff and Daniel Jones props. Uh, Lamar Jackson, Aaron Rodgers. I mean, listen, if Aaron Rodgers plays, I know you don't get any juice on that, but dude, this Bears defense, holy, yep. holy moly! Like the dudes that they're they're the Bears <laughs> defense right now. The, the guys they're putting on the field defensively are equivalent to what the Rams are putting out offensively. Like they are just playing all like preseason guys. And Eddie Jackson got hurt last game, and he's probably not going to play the rest of the season. Like. They are just they are just putting dudes on the field. Isn't right this now more of like a Aaron Jones runs for 180 yards game than sure? But I mean, it could be a Rogers FU game. Remember, he owns the Bears. Yeah. Like, we, I think this is our first true Christian Watson main slate game too, right? And it kind of feels like I don't know if anyone's excited because I mean, maybe people are just like the like he can't keep getting there, right? Like. Doug Baldwin went for like uh, a couple years ago. Remember he, remember Doug Baldwin had like a stretch where he just like scored all these touchdowns. Yeah. And people were like, I'm not playing him next week because he's not going to be able to do it again. Like Watson and Watson's usage is really good. I mean, the target share is amazing. Over the past yeah. three weeks, I mean, he's he's second in yards per run amongst all receivers. But even in, in, under the hood, 19th in team target share, 17th in target rate per run. Like he's five two on DraftKings. Whoever had the uh, TJ Duckett, Doug Baldwin, exact the box, like cash your tickets. That's we, we're good for that on this show. I mean, the, the, this Bears defense, though, man. Like, I actually underrated them. I knew they were bad last week coming in, but like, man, they are real bad. Like, the dudes they're putting on the field, like, wouldn't make a lot of rosters right now. Uh, Thirty-four and a half points per game and six and a half yards per play since week seven. They are getting doused. Was it three hundred rushing yards last week? They gave up. Was that three? The uh, wait. Uh, that was the Packers. Oh, that was the Packers. They're oh, also bad. Yeah, I'm sorry. Three, three yeah. sixty-three, and also Fields plays. Yes, uh, yeah. It's Justin Fields even is live here. Maybe both running backs in that game are are interesting. Uh, where Fields isn't going to play, is he? Like, why? I mean, maybe, but why? I we'll see. Dean, it's week thirteen. I don't know anything anymore. <laughs> I'm just my brain is melted. <laughs> All right, it's Wednesday night. Uh, well, we'll see. But I, I can't imagine they would play Fields, but maybe they do. Maybe they think they still have a chance. Uh, all right. Do, ch- do check out Thrive. Check out the promo code GRINDERS. $250. Up to 100% deposit match. Up to $250. Favorite plays, position by position. Uh, John, you wrote in the write-up, like you just wrote Jalen Hurts. You like him at quarterback. You can play him a quarterback <laughs> in fantasy, no matter what you want to call him. He is a quarterback, according to the sites, at least. At least uh... – uh, I didn't even remember. I just put that in the email. I really, that's why it's week 13. I don't even remember <laughs> what I write anymore, but yes, I think Jalen hurts is in an absolutely amazing spot. If I had one thing to sell you on this week for the Mac Jones flag plant, it would be uh Jalen hurts because we've seen the Titans send only 26 blitzes all year. Like instead they lead the league with pass rushes of four men or less. And only Tua has averaged more yards per attempt against four pass rushers or less than Jalen Hurts this year. Both quarterbacks, by the way, who are averaging over nine yards per attempt in that situation. And not only that, but we know you attack the Titans through your wide receivers. They're allowing the most yards per attempt to opposing wide receivers. And we've seen without Dallas Goddard the last two weeks, A.J. Brown and Devonta Smith have accounted for 59% of these teams' targets. And also remember that Rich mentioned just earlier that this Titans team, a higher pass rate over expected the last three games since Tannehill returned from injury. Tannehill also at least 34 pass attempts in two of his last three games. And more importantly, like the Eagles can't run the ball here. No player is rushed for more than 66 yards against the Titans since week two. They have to throw the ball. And so I think it's a nuclear spot for Jalen Hurts. Now, how do I fit him into the construct of this slate? I still don't know. I'm going to double stack <laughs> him and I probably have to avoid, well, I can fit Sky Moore, but I have to avoid like other Chiefs Bengals players in it. Other than that though, dude, like Jalen Hurts is in a blow up spot in my opinion. Uh, Rich, I want your thoughts as far as Hurts, other quarterbacks you like as well, but we're going to, we need an official take as far as Cleveland, uh, Deshaun Watson uh, being back, uh, you know, revenge game, instant revenge game there in Houston. Uh we got it. We have to at least touch on Watson here in uh, in Houston, right? Yeah, I mean, we can. I mean, it's the same story with Houston, though. Like every week, like does the opposing team have to do anything in the second half? Uh, you know, they are twenty seventh in yards allowed per pass attempt, thirty first in yards allowed per completion. 
Uh, but they have they haven't led in the second half of a game since week five. Uh, and as a byproduct, they are facing the fourth fewest pass attempts in the NFL, and they've allowed just two top 12 scoring weeks on the season to opposing quarterback just because nobody has to throw against them. It's just the same story every week. And it's like they're bad against wide, they're bad against wide receivers and bad against quarterbacks, but those two positions just don't get the run out on a weekly basis, uh, which is a problem. You don't get a full game out of your players uh, against them. So first game back, like how cutthroat are the Browns going to be? How much does Watson coming back alter the Browns kind of tendencies? Uh, he hasn't played in two years. So like, you know, there's a lot of things in play and Nick Chubb's probably going to go nuts, right? Like, yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, Watson, I think it's interesting. I think if you've stashed in this long, like a season long league, I think if you want to sprinkle in some tournaments, people will be, uh, there's no reason not to play him outside of just like, can he get there? But like, I, out of all the plays that are so good this week, man, I just don't know if he's going to be, it's a week where I'm going to get there on him. I feel like he might get some artificial ownership just because people like, for lack of a better term, like the shiny new toy, right? Uh, and we've seen it before, obviously. And like you said, it's been two years since you've seen this guy. Who knows what sort of like readiness he has as far as playing football? It is a soft landing spot. But uh, do you have anything to add there, John, as far as Watson, or you want to talk about some uh, running backs? Or right, I guess, uh, Rich, are you done with your running backs? Running backs? I, I'll say I, one quarterback I think is uh, – you know, this game didn't make the cut because there were some other games. But uh, 49ers-Dolphins, obviously another marquee game on the slate. Uh, Jimmy Garoppolo looks pretty good. I think, uh, I think he's in for a real big spike, you know, spike spot. I mean, one Miami's not a good pass defense to begin with. I mean, they're bottom like quarter and everything. Uh, they play the fifth most man coverage in the NFL. Jimmy is the third highest red quarterback against man coverage. Uh, there's a lot of stacking pieces that destroy man, man coverage, uh, uh, that we will get to in positional play. So maybe you just play those guys instead. But I think Jimmy Garoppolo is pretty interesting this week. And he reminds me a lot of the Chiefs game when they faced the Chiefs uh, earlier in the season. And he was the 10th highest scoring quarterback that week. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for him too to be like really sub single digit ownership. McDaniel revenge game, I guess. I don't know if it's, if it's revenge or not, but that'll be interesting. Kind of an underlying uh, theme of that game as well. Um Anything else, Sir John, as far as quarterbacks? That's how we jump the running backs. Oh, Mike White, you probably still keep playing him. Yeah, what he was awesome in like a monsoon. So like that's worth acknowledging. You win uh, you know, the reason we were targeting Mac Jones last week because of the Vikings secondary. And it was against the Bears, but even downfield, Mike White was four or four on throws 15 yards downfield. Like he had some explosiveness to him too. So And you see the play calling. They they ran more play action. They yeah. threw the they threw the ball more in early downs. There's just more of a trust, right? Like with him in the offense. We know they inherently have good players because they've used a lot of high draft picks on these players. Uh and like just like say take Dangle's Mac Jones take from last week and just insert it here. Correct. Uh because the, the Vikings are a team that they play a ton of zone coverage. Uh and they don't really stop anybody through the air. And as, as we talked about with the Hunter Henry take, tagging along with Matt Jones as well, take Tyler Conklin and add that same take as well. Like, oh, okay. He had a 10.5% target share in his first game with Mike White, but that doesn't mean it's going to stay that way, especially since he's still running around and over 70% of dropbacks. This is not a tight end section. Go ahead, Dean. I was pretty bummed to see how popular Garrett Wilson was, though. I knew he was going to be popular on DraftKings, but I was bummed to see how popular he was on FanDuel. Um, I, I faded him on DraftKings, not because I didn't like him, simply because he was a cash game player and too cheap. I couldn't play him in tournaments. I didn't expect him to expl- like kill the earth, though. I moved off of it somewhat, and the weather kind of deterred me. And I, I, I'm never the guy that freaks out about weather. But I was just... Yeah, how many good fantasy decisions have you made in your life based on weather? <laughs> I tell people every time we do this, like the Sunday morning chats, I'm just like, I've, I can maybe count the, the time in my hands where I've made a really good decision based on weather. And any other time I've incorporated weather, I've gone back like three hours later and been like, well, why the hell did I do that? We have all done this show together for three years. Rich has been one of my very best friends in life for six years. Uh, and about this time of the year is always when he says that same sentence and he's always right. It's yeah. Name the last time you made a good decision based on weather. That's it. Can you just record that in my phone? I can save that whenever Next I'm having yes. on Sunday morning. Listen, if they if the chat still reminds me of my birthday, which is Monday, by the way, oh. about uh, every single week, <laughs> then yes, they will remind you about the weather and Rich saying that sentence next year at this time. We've He's still got another five weeks of winter here, winter weeks to talk about it. 
do you still do something for your birthday? Is that still a thing? Do you still care? Do you still I mean did you acknowledge that? To- well, no. The, the the running joke is that I don't care, and yet the chat reminds me every week. So uh, I will be I will be thirty thrive next Wednesday, and uh, we'll see if I fall apart then. Who we'll knows? have to uh, we'll have to get you something for your birthday. We'll see. Stay tuned. Go. I'm gonna <laughs> wa- I'm gonna I'm gonna watch a movie on my birthday night. Apparently, oh, we'll tell you what movie it's gonna be because so I played watch. Lamar Jackson and Demarcus Robinson, so I can't wait. <laughs> Well, it was Lamar got there in the end. It could have been better. Yeah, but, twenty-four uh, points. I mean, the Marcus Robinson didn't help you. No. Well, also, uh, we'll talk about when we get there. Or Mark Julio, Andrews. Well, no, go, Julio Jones didn't help me either. But yes, continue. I thought Julio Jones was pretty ambitious in a four-man person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I saw it. I'm like, oh, the rest I'm, of your team, like, cool. You had Julio Jones. I remember that. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm an ambitious individual. Reeves. I love it. I love it. It's not like Thrive, where you get like 100, like 35. Listen, points producer Steve, week. We, we, the week before, played a one-off that was that hit right. Something goofy. Yeah, I can't remember what it was, but yeah, every once in a while, he's like, "Well, that, that's a weird." When you that was the last person in, like he was like, "I have this much money left." I guess this, I'll pick this guy. This is why I like four for four in the Discord and everything too. I I recommend I give them the fishing pole, not the fish, because when you do this as long as we've done it, I like I just stop caring, like and not caring in a way I don't want to win, caring in a way like I understand these plays look ugly from the outside, but like that's not the point of lineup construction. So like I'm gonna have some bad plays. It's no big deal. I don't mind, and I don't want to also put people in that position as well. So fishing pole, not fish, but never Julio Jones as well. It's a great approach, actually, to just, just like, yeah, just like say, I don't care uh, because a certain percentage of the time it's going to work. And, uh, you know, you can laugh at me if it doesn't, but everybody's going to fail to a certain degree, uh, no matter how good any play happens. To Rash- I mean, Rashad White, 6,300, and like, I'm not worried about his rushing or touchdown prowess at all. Like, of course, I'm going to try to pivot off of it. Yeah. I need to add some more of that to my game, to be perfectly honest. Uh, John, running backs, what do you got? What do I have? Uh, Damian Pierce. Oh no. Browns are <laughs> I don't know why I started with that one. Browns are bottom three. It's a bad suggestion, actually. Browns are still bottom three <laughs> and rate of 10, 10 yard runs allowed. Uh, um I, I, I think this game's gonna be slowed down again. We talked about our uh worry about Deshaun Watson his first game back. So I think it's a lower scoring total. And again, Damian Pierce, the last two games is averaging 1.6 yards per touch. I still blame that on the Texans offense more than anything. But if there were ever a spot for to get it right, it'd be this one. No one's going to play him because he's been terrible. Uh, Gus Edwards on FanDuel is going to sneak by. But a the highest share of backfield touches for any Ravens running back in any game this year, 84% last week. And that was his first game back from injury. They literally just forgot about Kenyon Drake for just two touches. So I, I don't mind playing Gus Edwards in a positive game script against a miserable, miserable Broncos offense. And then Rich already hinted at it earlier. David Montgomery in this Packers game is kind of hot. Uh, we, we mentioned how bad the Packers defense was and the Bears defense as well. Also, we saw Sunday night 363 yards r- allowed to uh, the Eagles. So yeah, like David Montgomery only came off that field for Darrington Evans. Uh, out touched Darrington Evans 17 to 10 because it was negative game script. They got blown out by the Jets. But at the same time, if Aaron Rodgers is under center, I know the Bears defense is bad, but the Packers offense has also been pretty bad. So I think like some David Montgomery, Christian Watson skinny stacks are really live here. Well, you're not going to like this. Wednesday night, you talked about people aren't going to play. Oh, damn it. He's the number, he's the only running back that hit my threshold. <laughs> I mean, I hate, the I hate don't DFS. care how bad this person did last week. They, they, they see the opportunity, right? And the yeah. presumption is opportunity is going to be there. Presumption is not going to be a complete blowout. Um, but there are people are going to be so like that have been. That, that, there are people out there that say never again. Somebody out there said never again. Damian Pierce. Um, he, and the price is really appealing. This is something that might you know go away on Sunday, and the ownership is going to be subdued. But as of right now. Easily, it's looking good in optimals. Dude, these these last two weeks, though, I'm telling you, have been so much fun, even in losing for lineup construction, because, again, GPP builds are back. Like, they are fading properly. <laughs> They're flexing the wide receiver as opposed to eating the chalk at running back. Like, it's been fun going the opposite builds the last two weeks. So maybe we get this the rest of the season because we got the opposite the first nine weeks. What do you got, Rich? Running back. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of good running back, a lot of good plays on this slate. Obviously, uh, you know, you don't need to be anyone to be talked into Nick Chubb in this matchup. No. Uh, you know, the most explosive 
yardage rusher in the NFL facing the team that allows the most explosive rushing yardage in the <laughs> NFL. Uh, Pierce definitely is interesting. The one thing about Pierce, and I wrote it up in the worksheet the last two weeks too, is he had miserable matchups both weeks. Like I was kind of off in both weeks. The wor- I think the worry you are just now is where the state of the Texans as a team are right now. Uh, that's probably the more primary concern because he does walk into a better matchup. Uh, speaking of walking, Kenneth Walker uh, probably will just get a ton of, of touches in the second half. I know that he's very volatile as a runner. Everyone's citing the stats that have existed since he went to Michigan State. But the dude's just probably going to get a ton of touches. I mean, since he's been the starting running back, he has 125 of 150 backfield touches. Do, is there any fight the Rams put up here? Like, is it, do you, without Aaron Donald? No. Uh, you know, uh, the Rams have only had 39 carries this season from running backs out Aaron Donald on the field, but they're allowing four and a half yards per carry on those carries. So, like, he's probably just going to get the run out, right? Like, he's a huge – he's a, he's not a home favorite, but he's a huge favorite that's going to get a ton of touches. Uh, we talked about Aaron Jones. We do have one cheapy revealed already in Jalen Warren. Uh, the the Steelers, since they're by – have really run the ball well. Like Najee Harris was actually kind of coming around uh, and like was kind of back into our heart. Since the bye, the Steelers have rushed for 217 yards, 102 yards, and 172 yards. Since week eight, the Atlanta Falcons have allowed the RB5 scoring week to Deontay Foreman, the RB5 scoring week to Austin Eckler. He's actually good. Uh, The RB9 scoring week to Deontay Foreman again the RB6 scoring week to David Montgomery, and then last week the RB5 scoring week to Brian Robinson. Like, that's not a a very, like, great rogues gallery of saying, like, dude, they face Dalvin Cook, you know, all the, like, Atlanta is getting bum-rushed by guys that are, like, we're even starting to start the year. So, I mean, listen, we've got one cheapy reveal. I think Jalen Warren is is in a really good, strong spot uh, looking at the start of the week. And if you're worried about Benny Snell, just remember <laughs> one, uh, Jalen Warren already full practice on a Wednesday, and two, Benny Snell didn't have a single touch this year, not one before he was forced into the lineup because two running backs were injured. So that was a Monday night game. So because it was a Monday night game, the price on uh, if Harris is out, Warren's going to be like Chalk City four nine on DK five K on Fanduel is so useful. <laughs> Um, I uh, he's going to be played on Fanduel. I I think it's a different situation though altogether than last week. Whereas we had Latavius Murray, Rashad White, and Jeff Wilson, and thus like and Michael tra- Carter and Michael Carter. Right? Well, he was yeah, he was bad. We but, might have that again this week, barring the time we get to Sunday. That's true. That's true. And so my, this what I'm about to say is just Except irrelevant. For hasty, thing. hasty is pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> that what I'm about to say is then irrelevant if we get to that point. But right now, like Jalen Warren is the only cheapie, thus it's a different conversation than 80% Wilson in week 12 compared to 80% Warren in week 13. Uh, you know, last week we had those running backs, and so then they were bad plays, that's why they weren't winning lineups. I'm all about playing my UCF guys. You know, I'm a homer to some degree, <laughs> but Latavius Murray, I just can't do it, man. I can't do it. Like 33 on the – I just the he had stats. a fifty-two yard run. It just didn't matter because the offense can't put it in. Yeah, he actually had a good like you know stat line, I guess. But thirteen yeah. carries, like ninety yards or something like that, and good for him. And it's cool to see him still kind of you know getting all he can get out of his career. But man, and it, just the Denver offense, it's just the overall stench. Um, what was the comment somebody the coach talked to uh, Russ and told him to stop doing like the uh, Broncos let's ride or any sort of the rah rah stuff, which is hilarious. <laughs> when uh, when Mike Purcell yelled at him, he went out and threw a touchdown. So maybe Purcell should yell at him every single possession. Give me some receivers, Rich. Uh, some of your favorite receivers we've got to talk about. Well, we talked about Watson. He's particularly cheap on DraftKings. Uh, yeah. Like I said, any, anybody the Bears are faced, like I mean, you just have to start looking at the Bears. And their opponent, no matter what, it was, no matter how you feel about the Packers and Aaron Rodgers, or like you just gotta play these guys like every week against the Bears. Uh, the last five weeks, they are giving up over three points per drive. They're allowing the most touchdowns per drive. They're allowing they have the league's lowest sack rate. They're allowing the most yards per play. Like it's just just play anybody you want that, that plays in the opposition. Uh, so you can get him in. Uh, I'll try to give you a couple oddballs. Like like Daigle, I think you can play the. The, the Eagles guys are great. Imagine not wanting to play Arthur Juan in a revenge game. Um, oh, I, I think I forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think Tyree Kill. Listen, I'm going to find ways to get this 49ers Dolphins game incorporated. I don't know if it'll like there'll be cash pieces here, but like 
There are a lot of guys. I think you start with Tyree Kill, not for the token Tyree Kill stuff. Uh, but he also moves around in the slot a lot, and that's like I said at the end of the show. That's where, where you want to attack the 49ers. Uh, 25th in touchdown rate, the opposing slot receivers, 29th in yards per target. His counterpart in that game, Brandon Ayuk. Brandon Ayuk has outscored Debo Samuel in four of their past five games played together. Uh, we talked about the man coverage stuff for Miami. Against man coverage, Brandon Ayuk is a 29.5% target per route rate. Against zone, it's just 19.1%. So a pretty massive difference. Uh, give him some kind of leverage there. Uh, and then two cheapies on DraftKings. DraftKings only plays. Uh, Nico Collins, like DraftKings just doesn't care that like he's getting all these targets. Like he's he's out targeted Brandon Cooks the last three games since he came back. He's getting like nine, 10 targets a week still. I know that they're not giving you a lot on those, but like you're getting those for 4K, like just take them. And then below that, no one will want to play him. Van Jefferson, just oh. listen, man, just do it. Seven <laughs> targets, 29% team target. He scored a touchdown in two of the past three weeks. It's gross, but if you have to have the money, I'm just saying. Man. Um, by the way, Christian Watson, 28% of optimals on a Wednesday night. Garrett Wilson, 52% of optimals on a Wednesday night. He's 5,300 on DraftKings. Like, Kalish was looking at flannel rainmakers packs. He was not worried about Garrett Wilson's salary. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Zacchaeus, by the way, is getting some ownership. I know. Oh, God. No, don't God. do it. Don't, not... do it. don't do it. Van, Van Jefferson, fine. Zacchaeus, no. We got to draw a line somewhere. Yeah. Salary makes a difference. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. I mean, uh, we've done the Atlanta pass catcher thing, man. Yeah, it's it's bad. We've done um, this life. I even tried to hold out some hope. I mixed in Drake London a little bit last week. They say, I'm like, all right, well, you know, earlier in the season, the first game Kyle Pitts out, he got you know, seven targets. I'm going to mix them in because, you know, the matchup was fine still. And I was like, I'm going to mix them in. Uh, two two receptions later and three hours later, did yeah, not feel great. The, the fact that I played Julio Jones in a four-man league instead of Drake London against <laughs> y'all tells you everything you need to know about Drake London. I, ha- I have zero respect for the Falcons offense. Uh, Rich pretty much picked out everyone, but also if you play A.J. Brown, you know, Trey Lumberks is pretty much coming on strong. It's pretty obvious. Uh, last three games now since he returned yeah. from injury um, has earned a target on 25% of his routes compared to, let's say, Robert Woods, the next closest, eight, just 18.5% of his routes. Also has led the team or tied for the team high in targets in back-to-back games. And more importantly, ran more routes than Nick Westberger Keen. So this opportunity is growing stronger this past week for the first time since week four when he was initially injured. So if you play Eagles players, just run it back with Burks, not only for what I just mentioned, but because as Rich mentioned, Henry is pretty much going down right now until he gets that sweet fantasy playoff schedule. I, we've been here before. He's, I can't wait for Derek Carter. Dude, this week. week 15, 16, he's going to blow the fuck up. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. 3% of them. Yep. Um, yeah, I mean, Burks looks pretty useful at 4-6 uh, on DK. I like that. The arrows are certainly up on him for sure. He's looking like uh, a keeper. N- n- nice draft pick here out of Tennessee as a replacement. The re- yeah, the replacement's got to show up against, uh, you know, A.J. Brown. You know, Brown's going to show up for sure. All right, I won't ask you, John. I'm just going to ask Rich. And you want to abstain. You don't want to give us any tight ends. Uh, Rich, no, I'll, 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 to be fair, I was going to mention Pat Fryermuth. That's like the only other tight end I mention every other week. <laughs> you, you, you just got to keep playing him. Uh, eventually, we can get there. We can say we finally got there. I mean, Kenny Pickett still has the lowest touchdown rate on throws 10 yards downfield and like the second lowest completion rate. Only Carson Wentz is throwing a lower completion rate when he was even playing uh, on throws 10 yards downfield than Pickett. Like Pickett's awful. And they said he played a better game on Monday night, like Pittsburgh beat writers. That's because they haven't seen a good quarterback in three years. They don't know what a good quarterback is anymore. So, <laughs> no, like, it's just Friar I don't care about the receivers at all. Every, everyone's going to cite Deontay Johnson's targets and expected points. They don't matter. It's just different. Expect that, No, it doesn't matter. Uh, Rich, uh, C, Pat, Friar and raise him. No, I like Friar uh, David Njoku, really cheap. Uh we saw him, you know, was kind of nursed back uh, in week 11. Last week, it's back up to 75% route rate. Uh, we don't know, like, what Watson's going to entail. Like, could there just be a lift, too, right? Like, could the Browns have more passing touchdowns? Could they, could Njoku have a higher ceiling? Like, we don't really know. Houston bad against tight ends. You just worry about the, uh, like you said, the, the overall targets in that game. But I think he's really just underpriced. Uh, and again, I, I keep getting alluding to the guys in this 49ers game, but. 
I think George Kittle is a pretty interesting tournament play this week. Obviously, he's basically just like a boomer bust tight end, tight end one. Uh, but Miami getting absolutely crushed by opposing tight ends, uh, 7.6 yards per target, 8.2% touchdown rate. Uh, those are all in the bottom six. They're also 31st in catches allowed to tight ends. Last time Kittle was in this spot was on Monday night, two weeks ago against the team that was this bad and, and got there. So we're going to find ways to, to stack this 49ers Dolphins game, man. Yeah, I feel like if that game's going to be ignored, I'm going to want some pieces of it. Um, pretty cheap price on FanDuel. I'm not sure if you mentioned that as far as the receivers. I don't think we talked about it much. If we can get uh, Debo to play a full game, uh, he's pretty cheap over there. Six, six, six on DK, I believe. Uh, yeah, that game, gonna, that game is not going to be rostered at all either. It's just going to be lost in the fold of three fifty-point games. And th- this is coming from someone who bet the under on Monday, so I'm, I'm ready to lose. Yeah, it's an interesting game because I can definitely see where it it lets down because it's kind of a prove-it game for both teams. I mean, since Tua has come back from his concussion, the Dolphins have faced the pass defense that are 28th, 30th, 31st, 22nd, and 27th uh, in the NFL. Uh, But the 49ers, while they are really good, they also have just not really faced any good quarterbacks outside of Patrick Mahomes. Yeah, uh, and Mahomes dusted them like they couldn't mm-hmm. stop the Chiefs in that game. So it is pretty an interesting dynamic to see like what wins out. Like uh, it, it, it's a very intriguing game. I definitely think from a real football stance, everyone's kind of honed in on this one uh, and, and trying to like be the most excited. So you have all the narratives, right? McDaniel going back to San Francisco, two has been awesome. Both these teams are on fire. Uh, yeah, but there's definitely. I mean, it could definitely go under still. It's as you mentioned last week against the Patriots, uh, it's a litmus test game and that could go either way, but yeah, I, I bet the under, but at the same time, when you can get premium to a doubles at less than 5% for like everyone, which is what they're going to come in on given the other game scripts. Like, yeah, it's always a good spot to give it a shot. All right. I think we did a pretty good job here as far as uh, setting the table for week 13. If that, if that's all you guys want, feel free to step aside and uh, make way. We're going to talk about, the four man briefly. We're going to talk about movies briefly. If you happen to be done, feel free to hit that like button, subscribe, turn on those notifications. We do appreciate that as well. Uh, let's let's try to get some engagement in the comment section. I was thinking about this. We'll talk about it in a second. Actually, I, I have a I have a question for the people. Maybe we'll pick a my, my favorite answer. I'll get you a, a week free of Roto Grinders Premium if you guys made it this far. But uh, let's go ahead and pull up the four man from last week. We'll take a peek and bring on producer Steve as well. Producer Steve, take your victory lap. And tell us, well, why did you give us the, if you guys aren't aware, uh, the winner of the four man has the other three people. If you couldn't piece that together, watch a movie of their choosing. Uh, producer Steve, you gave us the interview. All, all three of us happened to have seen it, but we were. No, no, I, I had seen it before. Oh, it was your first time seeing it. Okay. Yeah, so, first time watching it. Okay. So uh, I'm not sure if Steve's going to fire up the uh, our screen share. Here we go, Steve. Um, do you want to pull up? Well, let's talk about the interview first. Or what, what are we talking about first? The interview? Or are we talking about uh, the, the contest from last week? How do y'all want to do it? Uh, Daigle usually throws up the contest. Okay. Working on it right now. Yeah. Okay, that's why I wasn't. I wasn't sure if we're buying time. <laughs> My no. apologies. I just uh, wanted something fun and easy. But what did you guys? I mean, you guys saw it. Was it? Was it as funny as you thought? Was it less funny this time around? Uh, I'll go to Daigle first because Daigle, if you can multitask, you can bring up that screen and if you can talk. Um, I, my my impression was that I just thought it was a uh, more vulgar uh, that are raunchier than I remember. Not that I'm like displeased by that but i just don't recall it being as raunchy as it was but i shouldn't be surprised either knowing who was involved but uh yeah daigle your, your first time watching the interview uh what was your thoughts agree raunchy uh i feel as if i'm going to use the term honey dick in my normal <laughs> language <laughs> more often now because i i literally never heard that um other than that though no i just thought it was good we went from a feel-good movie initially to a, a seth rogan comedy like that's that's where we went. So no, I mean there's not too many thoughts. It's it's very good. It's like a what's that other one? I mean Seth Rogen's done a lot. End what's of the, the world. Yes, correct. That's that's what it reminded me of more than like a Pineapple Express one, like right, one that stands the test of time. It was a very end of the world. Like uh, I don't know how many people are talking about this movie, but it's funny. Like it's good for a one view. Sure. And yeah. what, what is your recollection, uh, Rich? As far as you haven't watched it in a long time, so you watched the interview. Fired up on the Netflix. Uh, what stood out to you? 
Yeah, uh, I listen. Still, uh, I've had Katy Perry in my head for two days uh, from it. Uh, <laughs> it, it. It's just been it just earwormed me to death. Uh, I, I will say, like I said earlier, like the Franco stuff hits different now. Uh, now knowing like what's happened with Franco, but huge Randall Park fan, and huge huge Lizzie Kaplan fan from the Party Down days. Yeah. Uh, so very very. Uh, anytime I can get those two incorporated into anything, I'm always on board. I think Party Down's coming back. Aren't they resurrecting that show? I, I hope like not. I want it just to live out where it was. Well, everything is getting rebooted. You don't want you're, you're saying you're going to watch it though. I mean, of course I am, Dean, but that doesn't mean that. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't want it to come back and be worse, Dean. My fear of everything is just like it's going to come back and be worse and then ruin the the initial feelings of things. It's not going to retroactively make your enjoyment from five seven years ago any worse. But it's going to make people say like if it comes back and it sucks, people are going to be like, oh, everyone is like, oh, I love this show, and then you know everyone's gonna be like, everyone told me to watch it, and then it ended up being bad. And then, you know, yeah, Adam Scott is he was also in the cast, right? Oh, yeah, it was like all the people from uh, MTV, the, the state. Do you remember the show, the, the state? That's like basically the whole cast, like Ken Marino and Scott, like everyone from that. Okay, I didn't realize, I, I know I've seen like episodes, and uh, geez, I, I, I'm trying to remember who was the Steve Gutenberg episode, is what I remember. Yep, yep. <laughs> they Steve, somehow they were parting at Steve Gutenberg's house. What was your uh, second reaction? Dean, since you've seen this movie before, yeah, my, my, my reaction when it was I, I forgot that Eminem came out in this movie, so <laughs> good for him. Um, uh, I, and I forgot Rob Lowe was bald, <laughs> so again, yep. I picture the NFL hat on you know, I don't, I'm surprised he wasn't wearing the NFL emblem as far as his hat, but uh, yeah, I just thought it was it was much more vulgar than I remember, and again, not in a negative sense, just I'm like that's I shouldn't be surprised. It's fun, you know, it's a nice uh. And, I, and I'm, I'm pretty sure, I can't remember the timing when it came out, this movie I think was banned in the theaters or wasn't allowed to come in the theaters and they yeah, lost yeah, yeah. money because of it. Uh, something to do with the Sony hack, I think. Um, I'm not sure if it was like any way related because it was about Kim Jong-un. That, that was, is, that, is that a correlation? Is the reason why it was hacked? Don't remember. But um, yeah, I, I liked it. I mean, if it's on... I. I I don't flick through channels. You guys, I can't remember the last time I flicked through channels. Like the clicker, like up and down. Does anybody do that anymore? But if I would, hypothetically, I, I would consider stopping on it. Do you, just, do you still click through channels, anybody? Yeah. No. Wait, do. you click? You click? Yeah. Sometimes. I can't lie. I do sometimes. I want to see, I always, I always just want to see what movies are playing on channels, right? Because like uh, in my office, I just have the Roku and you can filter just for movies, right? Like there's the movie filter and you can just see all the movies are on whatever channels. So I'll just see what's on. Like typically while I'm working, I'll throw stuff on the background. But like everything is playing every time at all times. It's just kind of like- But sometimes I don't know what I want. I don't want to be pressed with that kind of conundrum to where like I have to open Amazon, Netflix, HBO Max and have to pick something out. I, mean, I want to, something to jump out of me and say, yeah, watch that. You want to be spoon fed? Like, it's a, literally like two clicks. You can jump on plus, Dean, plus, Dean, I love the randomization of when you know, like, oh, like, say, like, take the interview, for example, like, oh, the interview's on, like, but you don't know what part it's exactly on. <laughs> but I want to see, like, well, what part's it on? Like, yeah, 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 you know? So I and always I wondered, like, what person, like, Netflix has an option that says, um, uh, surprise me. Like, I've never gotten to that point in my life where I've just gotten no. to Netflix and click surprise me. No, and, and that's the goal, to never reach that point, <laughs> rock bottom. Uh, by, the, by the way, Dean, to your point, uh, yes, this movie was banned from theaters in 2014 because it had the assassination of a Korean leader. And the Korean... The, yeah, well, spoiler <laughs> alert from 2014. Uh, the Korean news released that there would be, like, an attack on the U.S., if this were released nationally, thus they had no choice but to shut it down and just not release it in theaters. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I knew they took a huge hit on it, and I think it went like video on demand. Maybe I feel like it might have. I but... think it actually went on Netflix the night it came out. Okay, that so... makes sense. I think that that's correct. I think you streamed it like it didn't come out in theaters at first. You yeah. streamed it. All right. Um, I will uh, select. I, I have a whole bunch of movies picked out, and I'll throw them. I don't know what you guys have seen. I haven't screened it, but I, just I couldn't believe two of you monsters played DJ Moore and got there. It was not me. It was not I me. I was one of them. I, I played DJ Moore also. Yeah, you monsters. Listen, <laughs> I, I, I played Demarcus Robinson, Reeves. Don't yell oh, at me. True. 
<laughs> Dude, I played Trey McBride. You said I went, I went full chalk. Trey yeah, it's a monster too. That's a monster too. Yeah. Oh, what a disappointment he was. Such like, sickening. He did anything. Dude. Um, but yeah, like you said, it was a, it was a game stack that I ran there. Chargers yeah. and Arizona. It's good. it's good. Yeah. Um, and James Conner, like he's not in the main slate this week, but like that his role now is just incredible. Um, yeah, just I feel like it's hurt. Yeah. Yeah, he wasn't as popular as I thought in large field stuff. It's probably just because there was so much chalk, oh. like running backs up and up, that just bit pushed people off. But he he closed as like even five percent, eight percent in small field. He was. I was anything. really surprised by the time we. Got I there. I late swapped onto him from my lineups. So a couple of things. Uh, somehow organically, and that is that word again. This came up on Twitter uh, in a conversation. We were talking about like best opening scenes for movies, like best movie opening scenes. I'll give you guys a second. I'm curious if you, have, if you have an answer, if you thought about it, because you've had this conversation before. And if you guys are watching this on the old YouTube, give me your best answer. Not any movies we mentioned. Go off the board, because then you're just copying. But give me the best movie uh, opening scene. Uh, answer that not in the actual chat if you're watching us live right now, but in the comment section. And, you know, if I happen to like your answer, I'm going to pick somebody. Uh, give me a way to contact you, and I'll hook you up. Or I'll mention it on the, on the pod next week. Uh, your favorite opening scene for a movie. I have some answers. And one of the answers I threw out there, and you, Dan Bach, his second mention, smashed the over, and Dan Bach mentioned this. He said he never saw this movie, and I was outraged that he's never seen this movie. But I gave you enough time, John. Give me a, give me your favorite movie opening you could think of off the dome. Off the top of my head, I come back to The Dark Knight. And yes. I think, yeah, yeah, I, think that, I think that was the first one that I got like really excited about before they ran the credits. Maybe something has happened before then, but I had to think longer. But The Dark Knight stands out. That's the chalk. That's a spectacular answer. That was one of my answers. You happen to have one, Rich? Yeah, uh, Inglorious Bastards for sure. I'm, I'm instantly hooked uh, with Christoph Waltz in the the beginning of that, like the milk and the pipe. Uh, instant, instantly, instantly hooked uh, in the beginning of that. By the same by the way, Private Ryan stands out. I mean, obviously oh, that yeah. was like you remember same Private Ryan. The second like, scene, but I know what you're saying. Like there's a scene oh, before. Yeah, I guess you're right. Yeah, yeah. I, I was thinking about that. It's kind of a technicality, and that second scene's really long and just insane and incredible. Um, but yeah. By the way, Inglorious Bastards, Dan Bach, if you're out there listening, he's never seen Inglorious Bastards. Like, come on, what are we doing? Uh, are we doing? The the final scene. It's not a spoiler alert. It's fine. But the final scene <laughs> is uh, Brad Pitt and B.J. Quinn looking down at the camera, saying, "Literally, the last sentence of the movie is this just might be my masterpiece." And yeah. that's literally Quentin Tarantino masturbating to himself, saying, like, this actually might be my best movie ever. And he might have a point. That movie is perfect. It's also, an incredible movie. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, the second X-Men movie was absolute fire. The, 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 the Nightcrawler opening scene. Like, really? it was, I, I don't even know. I haven't seen yeah, it. Yeah. Absolute no fire. Yeah. Okay. The, the Nightcrawler going to assassinate the presidency. I remember thinking, like, oh, this is making a huge jump from the first movie. I'm going like, to YouTube it. That's fine. absolute fire. I it's think it funny. still holds up to the CGI, but that, that I remember because the first X Men is more character driven. Obviously, they kind of do a lot of CGI. I think that came out in two thousand one. Was the first X Men movie? It kind of snowballed all these superhero movies we got now. But the second one opened with like full CGI Nightcrawler, and it was like, oh, this shit's fire. In chat, somebody said Kentucky Fried Movie. I think that's like a movie from the seventies or something like that. I think it's like a joke comedy movie. I'm not sure. I've never seen that. Uh, by the way, Tarantino recently just said his best movie is um, the, uh, what's it called? The Hollywood movie, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, which I, he, it's, has, he's got his opinion, but I think he's wrong. But <laughs> only because his, his, his catalog is so good. It's so fire. But I wouldn't put that number one. Uh, did you have an answer, Steve? Any, any of your favorite uh, openings you can think I've of? I've been trying to think that all the time, but no, nothing really that stands out. Okay. So I had on my list in Glorious Bastards, but I'm like, there's no way these guys haven't seen Glorious Bastards. Uh, also, on my list of uh, great opening scenes, you can't put this in the comments. Boogie Nights, that one shot is amazing. Uh, it's one of my favorite mm-hmm. movies of all time. I'm assuming you guys have seen that Boogie Nights, yes? Oh, yes. No. Uh, that's a. Uh, nope. uh, it definitely has to hold up. I haven't seen it in five years, but I'm guaranteeing you it holds up. It holds because up. Because it was, I keep saying Requiem for a Dream on this show, but it was like the Requiem of a Dream of its time. <laughs> Record for a Dream is like really depressing, though. Yeah, but I don't want to watch. Yeah, that's the thing. It, it actually no is a beautiful movie, movie, but I don't want to watch it again. I literally never want to see it again in my life. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's 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 too heartbreaking. 
Yeah, it just gets more and more depressing as that yeah. movie goes. So it's really well done for sure. I had Saw. I like the opening of Saw. Oh, that yeah. the horror, horror. I didn't think horror because the original, the very first Scream, I think, like the legit is one of the best opening scenes. Rich, my list, Bar- is Dark Knight. my list is Dark Knight, Inglorious Bastards, Boogie Nights, Saw, and Scream. You guys nailed yeah. this. Yeah, yeah, Scream, but yeah. that Drew Barrymore sets good because man, yeah. I haven't seen the first Scream in a long time. But I remember Scream the, and Scream. The latest Scream incredible. is pretty solid. The the newest one. I watched it on an airplane, so I don't really know. Like, it's I, I don't I don't really know how to gauge if it's good or not. Like I can't tell if that up makes it better or worse. It's, I mean, it's not like what they were. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I love to think about this, man. E- uh, if, even if you reverse it and say endings, like Saul, the first one, man, that's that was a that was an amazing movie. Some good answers in chat. There will be blood. The Paul Thomas Anderson movie. There's like no talking for the first ten minutes. Fuck yeah, that movie's inc- the soundtrack. Just right to that soundtrack. It's the best. amazing. I, I've abandoned my child. All right. Um, oh, and Up. That's another good one too. Kind of a sad. All right. Uh, well, don't please don't make me uh, up cry. Is, uh, yeah. Up was our modern land before time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So here's my list. And again, you've probably seen this. I'm, I'm trying to go off the board a little bit, uh, but. Let's see. What did I have that I wanted? To... Have you guys seen The Prestige? No, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Multiple least... times. It's my favorite airplane movie. <laughs> now you're just mocking me. I don't think you're gonna get. No, I'm not. Uh... I'm not. I'm not kidding. I love that movie. I don't think Why you're gonna, gonna get a Nolan movie though? past us. Well, hold because... on. have you seen Sideways? I have not. Mm-hmm. Sideways. Me neither. All right. Sideways. Sideways. Paul Giamatti. I love Paul Giamatti, but I've never seen Sideways. Yeah, Thomas, Thomas Hayden Church. Church. I've never seen it. Oh, there it's it is. A, I mean, it doesn't sound like it's a good movie. It's about like no, no, no I'm in. I'm all drinking in. wine or whatever, and then the wine. Yeah, there Sideways is. is a. Have you not seen movie. Dean this entire show? I had this big ass glass of wine. Like I'm literally just drinking. <laughs> oh, I mean, I don't know how you feel about Merlot, but like you're gonna get a strong stance from Paul Giamatti about how he feels about Merlot. <laughs> I I prefer Pinot, but uh, Merlot's fine. Let's talk about it. Let's go watch this mm-hmm. movie. I, I don't even like wine, and I love Sideways. It is fabulous. Steve, have you seen Sideways? I have not. There it is. We're locking it in. Um, in. Sideways is the movie. Uh, what else do we have here? Some people in chat throwing out some uh, some options. Kentucky Fried Movie. Yeah, I, I'm told I have to see Kentucky Fried Movie. I, okay, maybe. We'll, the Town is Spectacular, and that's another. I don't know that's a good opening. If I'm uh, I have sat Silva down live in person and told him Town's one of my favorite movies, and we were 10 minutes in. And he asked me, when's the next bank robbery? Because, like, there was a romance, obviously, in the story. Yeah. And uh, he just said, fast forward to the bank robbery. <laughs> he didn't care yeah. about the movie. Oh, right? come on. Is Silva really that guy? He can't just watch a movie and like, he has like character oh, development? Yeah. Unless it's uh, Saving Private Ryan or The Patriot with Mel Gibson. He's not sitting down. For a movie. <laughs> That's his no real way. house. <laughs> no way. No way. Oh, come on. Silva. That's, a, that's outrageous. I can't believe that. That's my boy. Well, that's the show. Uh, we stuck around, talked to the movies for a while. Uh, week 13, we got everybody all set. If you're still with us, people are still out there listening, Rich. Tell them where they can find you and all the all the socials. Uh, Adler Reeves on Twitter, sharpupanalysis.com. Obviously, we know uh, no one's like signed up for anything wild this year. But we're doing weekly packages, and the first week you do sign up is only a dollar. So you want to read the worksheet, some bank stats. It's over there. John? <laughs> At Naj Diggle on Twitter, I believe we're still making an 85% off rest of season for full4.com. Um, if I'm lying about that, just DM me. I mean, I'll give you a coupon. It's no big deal. Uh, other than that, it's a tough slate. I wish I had a further lean for you. I wish I could tell you how to fit in Jalen Hurts double stacks because it is my favorite stack. But, like, I also don't want to be left with, like, empty-handed here when the Bengals and Chiefs goes for 73 points. So, uh, yeah, we'll figure it out. It's only Wednesday. That was the NFL Pick 6 show for John, for Rich, for producer Steve, uh, for TJ Duckett, for Doug Baldwin. Tweet at Dan Bach, at Dan underscore Bach. And tell him, <laughs> tell him bring back the Super Bowl party. Well, one, bring back the Super Bowl party. <laughs> two, make sure you got to watch the Glorious Bastards <laughs> too, before yeah. the Super Bowl happens. How about that? We're giving you a lot of time there. Tweet at Dan and let him know. He's got to watch Glorious Bastards. Feel free to give him a gift, too. A lot of gift options for that movie. I was Dean. NFL Pick 6 show here for Roto-Grinders. Thanks for watching. Takes on some money this week. We're out of here. Bye.